Hello everyone, welcome to the 2022 Pilot Lecture in Bigotry and Tolerance. Thank you for joining us. Dr. Melissa Lovell, Research Fellow at the Australian National University and convener of the Herbert and Dalmay Pilot Project for the Study of Bigotry at the ANU. This year, I'm delighted to welcome Ukrainian Ambassador, His Excellency Vasil Moroshnichenko, to present the lecture. I would like to begin by acknowledging and paying my respects to the Ngunnawal people of the Canberra region, custodians and advocates for this beautiful country that we meet upon tonight. I also pay my respects to the elders who may be with us for this event. For almost 25 years, the pilot project for the study of bigotry has sought to contribute to our understanding of the history, causes and impacts of bigotry. The annual pilot lecture was the first regular event organised by the pilot project with the inaugural lecture held in 1997. In each year since, expert speakers from different professions and disciplines have presented on the important themes of bigotry and tolerance. This year, we are very pleased to host the pilot lecture in partnership with the ANU Centre for European Studies, the oldest research centre in Australia focused on the study of Europe and the European Union. The Centre for European Studies provides an ANU-wide platform for research and collaboration with Europe. I extend a warm welcome to the researchers, staff and students of that centre. This year's lecture also forms part of a series of events that the pilot project has organised to accompany the We Believe the Same exhibition. We Believe the Same is an anti-racism exhibition by photographer Tim Bauer and filmmaker and journalist Liz D. Jones. Sponsored by the Pilot Project, the exhibition is currently on display in the entrance to this building. It uses impactful photography and documentary film to challenge stereotypes and present the stories of many diverse people who have experienced racism. After the lecture, you're all invited to join us for the unveiling of the Ambassador's Portrait, which will form part of the exhibition going forward. I now invite Professor Ray Francis, the Dean of the College of Arts and Social Sciences and Chair of the Pilot Project Advisory Board to say a few words and to introduce his excellency. Thank you so much, um, Alyssa. Distinguished guests, colleagues and students, welcome to the annual Freilich Lecture on Bigotry and Tolerance. And I'm delighted to welcome back to the ANU his Excellency Ambassador um, Vasil um, Muroshnishenko, Ambassador of Ukraine um, and Mrs. Muroshnishenko and all our distinguished guests. And I'm especially pleased and grateful that we can gather here tonight in person on the lands of the Nambri Ngunnawal people where countless generations of elders have met and deliberated on the weighty issues of the day as we are tonight. And I pay my deep respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. And once again, there's war on the European continent, something most of us thought and hoped never to see again. These developments in Europe, the brutality of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which echoes the brutality we have seen elsewhere in the world, in Syria, Afghanistan, Myanmar or Yemen, have caused us to reflect anew on what it means to have the freedom, peace and stability and the rules on which such an order is founded. And it's been said frequently since the war in Ukraine escalated this year that Ukraine is fighting on our behalf. And I think there's much truth in that sobering proposition. What we can do geographically so distant but in human terms so close is to listen, to bear witness, but we, can also, we also can and should do, as Liz Deep Jones reminds us in the introduction to the We Bleed the Same um, project, supported by the Freilich Friday Project. What we can and should do is to speak up, stand up and take action against bigotry, racism, intolerance and animosity. It's therefore my honour to welcome and introduce His Excellency, Ambassador Miroshnishenko to deliver this year's Friday lecture, which this year has been organised, as we've just heard, in collaboration with our wonderful Centre for European Studies. His Excellency was appointed Ambassador of Ukraine to Australia in March 2022. He is also accredited in New Zealand and in charge of bilateral relations with eight Oceania countries. 
Previously, he was advisor to the Minister of Defence of Ukraine and partner of CFC Big Ideas, an international strategic communications consultancy, consultancy in Kiev. In 2021, he was appointed as a member of the supervisory board of the Ukrainian Institute, a cultural diplomacy outfit of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine. Prior to joining the Foreign Service, he was an active business and civil society leader in Ukraine. He's also a co-founder of Ukraine Crisis Media Center, a media NGO set up in early March, 2014, aimed at amplifying Ukraine's voice internationally. In 2015-16, he was a head of the Board of Professional Government Association, an NGO which has united Ukrainian alumni of the Western universities with the goal of mobilizing talent for the economic, legal, and judicial reforms in Ukraine. In 2018, he was a Marshall Memorial Fellow, a prestigious leadership program of the German Marshall Fund of the United States. Now, like all wonderful diplomats, he has a degree in um, humanities and social sciences. Mm -hmm. He has a Master um, of Science in Politics of the World Economy from the London School of Economics and Political Science. He also holds MA and BA degrees in International Relations from the Institute of International Relations, Kiev National Shevchenko University. He's also a graduate of the Global Village for Future Leaders of Business and Industry Program at Ayakaka Institute, Lehigh University, of the Swedish Institute Management Program, and the Center of Congressional and Presidential Studies at American University in Washington, DC. Please join me in welcoming the ambassador. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very kind introduction. And uh, firstly, I'd like to pay respects to the traditional owners of the land uh, on which we've gathered today, the Ganawal people, the past, the present, and the emerging. It's a great pleasure to be back at ANU. <clears throat> I think that's become my favorite university uh, <laughs> since I arrived. And this hall actually been probably the most welcoming to me because I've done, I've spoken here at least five times from what I can recall. And this is, of course, a great pleasure to come back to the European Center and uh, just to again see many of my friends. Uh, and of course, I'm very thankful to, to Lee Steve Jones for approaching me uh, and, and inviting me to join a project and then the invitation which came from the Freilich Center to do the, le uh, to do the lecture. And uh, I, it's, it, I was very honored and, and humbled because I believe that's my first lecture in itself which kind of delivered. and. Um, and understand you've had many different people uh, throughout 22 years since the Freilich Foundation uh, started the Center on the Study of Bigotry and Racism. There's so much I want to, to share with you, and um, there are so many things which are going on in Ukraine. And um, I was um, in Melbourne the, about three or four weeks ago, and I had a meeting with George Frydenberg, and he's a former treasurer in the previous government. And he gave me a book, and um, the book is called The Happiest Man on Earth, and by Eddie Jaku, a man who survived the Holocaust. And, um, and I started reading the book, and I read a lot of books about Holocaust in the past, uh, and many friends in Jewish community in Ukraine, but also uh, in, 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 in outside of Ukraine are my friends. So I've kind of looked at that um, dark history uh, many times. But reading this book now, and I started reading it. It's, it's an easy read. You can read it in, in while flying away around uh, Australia. And, and it just, um, and it's, it's a book about a Holocaust survivor, right? Who's gone through the concentration camps, about how he's been trying to find some optimism while being out there in the death camps. And, uh, and reading it for me now was extremely, <laughs> how to say that, I could relate a lot to what I read because every day I read about reports of Ukrainians who go through filtration camps, who are forcefully deported to Russia, those people who are suffering. And then you read about all the atrocities which are happening on the occupied territories of Ukraine. And you're like, you can only think like, we've, we've seen it before, right? We've seen it during the Holocaust. And we thought it was never again. But now, what, 80 years later, 
we see it's happening again. And, and this is so appalling, we just, and heartbreaking, of course. And often now, when we talk about this and we discuss this issue of fatigue, right? Fatigue of war. And being myself a Ukrainian, I can a lot relate to, to this feeling because there is so much out there that you can read about this war and why this war is so different because this war is all on in, in your iPhone, right? You can watch this war live from your laptop every morning, every day. It's live reporting. You can see torture live. You can see atrocities live. You can see explosions coming and drones you know, flying into Kyiv, exploding and killing people you actually know. And this is something which is different from the World War II. Because World War II has happened a long time ago. We do have clear accounts of what has happened. But it's been a long time ago. Most of the people who witnessed that are now gone. But this war will be memorized forever on our hard drives, on our phones. And will we ever be able to forgive or forget what has happened? Probably not. Because it's a different technology has gone so, so ahead of time that it's, that it's now impossible to, to, to erase it. And now we have to actually look at what is happening and why it's happening and why racism and bigotry is a big part of it. And then we have to actually delve a bit deeper. And I understand we have many historians here in the room. And those who are interested in the history of Ukraine, I would really encourage you to delve a bit deeper and read more about this. But probably one of the best books for you would be a book by Timothy Snyder who is a professor of European history from Yale University. And he's, he's written a book called Bloodlands of Europe. And Bloodlands of Europe is about 20th century. And by reading this book, you will get a very good understanding of what's happening in Ukraine now. Because uh, this invasion of, uh, of Ukraine by Russia, this is nothing new for, for us Ukrainians. Uh, it's been happening for 300 years. For 300 years, We've been part of the Russian colony, I mean, for a long time, right? And in different periods, but at the same, at the end of the day, it always ended up with Russians coming in, killing us and subjugating Ukraine. When uh, the Tsar fell in 1917, uh, we had Ukrainian National Republic uh, proclaimed, and that was a brief period of Ukraine's independence, which lasted about a bit less than four years. We had three different uh, governments out there at that time, tumultuous times, right after the First World War, you know, Ukrainian Republic is born, uh, and a lot of a lot of hope for the future. But then the Bolsheviks come in 1921, they crush Ukraine's independence, kill many Ukrainians, proclaim a Ukrainian Socialist Republic, and announce uh, the establishment of the Soviet Union. Interestingly enough, that date is December 19. 22. A lot of thinking behind Vladimir Putin, he's very kind of very strong on dates. He loves dates, he loves symbolism. His idea was to take over Ukraine in three days with an invasion in February. And by the end of December, was to actually proclaim a new kind of revived empire Russia, which would probably include Belarus, which probably include all Central Asian countries, Moldova as well, and sort of make a point, the Soviet Union, which was created 100 years ago, is again reestablished in a new form called Russia-Eurasia Union. You can, there could be different name that could be picked for that. But the thinking and motivation behind that was the same. That was about reviving an empire, reviving a strong state. And in a way, it's interesting to look into the psychology and mentality of the people who are behind it and why they're doing it what is out there which is motivating these people who come to this decision. And a lot of that is actually comes down to the past and the upbringing of this generation of the rulers in Russia. And actually just only one man who is in charge. He's got all power which is out there. Uh, by the time that he's ruled for 22 years, he's become the richest man in the world. All the oligarchs in Russia, all that their status to, to, to him. 
and um, he's created a system of where he believes that the West is to blame for the collapse of the Soviet Union. And he's made this famous speech uh, in 2007, blaming uh, the West uh, that Soviet Union collapsed and everybody stopped fearing Russia and they've lost respect. And that was that craving for respect which has been driving a lot of that aspiration to renew the fear, to renew respect. And this is actually something interesting. It, it's very prevalent in, in, in Russia. And in a way, this is something that has been driving that. And since Putin got into power in 1999, he's actually was working and making sure that he can revive that big empire. Russians have been really working hard that Ukraine does not join NATO. But the only reason Russia did not want us to be part of NATO was because they wanted, they wouldn't be able to invade Ukraine. They always had a plan to get Crimea back, to get Ukraine back, and to actually take over Ukraine. But pretty much starting from the time when Putin rose to power, uh, they've taken the ownership of all television and all media in Russia. I mean, pretty much all those oligarchs which existed in the Yeltsin time, they had to flee. Many of them got killed. Uh, some survived, but they're not in exile. And all the media became state-owned. And of course, with the emergence of, 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 of internet, Russia has really been very good at actually harnessing internet and all the social media which came, having full control of what's going on over there. And they've started building their own kind of narrative about how Ukraine is being perceived in Russia. And this is the most interesting part, which probably will be the most relevant to our lecture today on bigotry and racism. And I think for 20, over 20 years, Russian media was systemically working on actually creating a certain image and reputation for Ukraine or actually building the portrait of the country, of those who who hate Russia, or those who don't want to be friends with Russia, or on stuff like that. Actually, going there are different ways how they've been doing it, and different narratives which were promoted. But actually, this whole systemic work in public domain, of course, there were kind of different ways, right? Throughout this 20 years of, of over 20 years of Putin's rule, the, the narrative has been changing, it's been evolving, there have been some ups and downs, but they're kind of different ways. When we can also analyze it from the standpoint of of media analysis and the coverage. But the interesting part is that pretty much by, by you know, closer by last year, there was a survey, who is the biggest enemy for Russia? Ukraine was number one. And it's interesting to see because we, Ukrainians never thought that, you know, in a way there could be a war with Russia. If somebody asked me nine years ago, would Russians ever invade? I would say, no, why would they do it? It doesn't really make sense. And apparently many of us have connections to Russia. And because we were part of colony, a big part of our identity was erased. And the way Russian expansion and the way colonies work, they try to erase the indigenous, the local culture, identity, language, religion. They try to erase it and they try to actually take over it. And hence the claim that Ukrainians and Russians are one nation. But there's a very colonial kind of promotion which is out there and a colonial narrative. Russians refuse to recognize that there is Ukrainian language, Ukrainian culture. They refuse to recognize that we're different. But it's interesting to see that this is their policy, not only towards Ukraine, but all the other groups in the big sort of Soviet empire, but now also in, in Russia. And Russia has many indigenous people many different ethnic groups, different religions, but as a title nation, which Russians are, they've been able to actually build on that and try to erase any kind of identity which would not be Russian. One of my favorite countries is Canada. And in Canada, it's always been about underlying your origin. So I'm 100% Canadian, but I'm 100% Ukrainian. There is a big Ukrainian community in, in Canada, over 1 million people. 
and in and also well i'm not sure how it is in australia because in america it's a melting pot everybody becomes an american right so like your origin is not underlined in russia on the russian empire everybody became russian right and the way it was done it was done throughout many generations throughout many years ukrainian language in the russian empire was banned many times instruction in school instruction at universities was all dominated in russian so many people have lost their language they started speaking Russian. My parents are both medical doctors. They went to a medical school in Western Ukraine, which is primarily Ukrainian speaking. But in the Soviet times, instruction was only in Russian at the university level. When I was a kid in a Ukrainian speaking family, the only books I could read were in Russian because all the books for kids were not available in Ukrainian. But that was part of the policy of the Soviet Union, and this is something which has been, in a way, inherited by Russia, modern-day Russia, but taken to a new level. There are one million Ukrainians in Moscow, but not a single Ukrainian school. If you go and ask those Ukrainians in Moscow, who are you? They will say they are Russian. They would never recognize their origin of Ukrainian, because it was erased throughout two or three generations, and they say, yeah, yeah, we, we just come from Ukraine, but we are Russian. And it was done on purpose, and that was a way to actually erase a whole nation, erase the identity, and to refuse us the right to be a distinct European nation. You know, Eastern European, Slavonic uh, country, freedom-loving country, country which loves democracy, which likes human rights. And you see, that was the biggest problem for Putin. So he's built an authoritarian system where everything is under control. And he's got Ukraine out there. And we Ukrainians, we, if we don't like other presidents, we take them down. And we've done it a number of times. We have only one president who served two terms, all the rest served one and we're out. So we really, when we don't like our leaders, we, we just go and demonstrate and we vote them up. And this is something which Putin cannot afford. He can't have Ukraine next door, building a democracy, integrated into the European Union, and serving as an example to the Russian people that actually you can have elections and you can have democracy. And that was an existential threat to Vladimir Putin. So he lobbied heavily for Ukraine not to be able to get on track on the NATO membership action plan in 2008, convinced some of the key countries in NATO not to give that green light on Ukraine. He invaded Georgia, occupied Georgia, the reaction to the occupation of Georgia was very weak. Putin got emboldened. He invaded Ukraine in 2014, invaded 7% of Ukraine's territory, parts of Donetsk, Luhansk, and Crimea. And the response was weak. So it further emboldened Putin. The sanctions which were imposed were weak. And eight years later, Russia has beefed up its military, invested lots of money, They've been able to do that because they've been selling lots of gas and oil, built two new pipelines to Europe, and there are just all this money that was coming in was put into the military. And then the day came, and there was like that opportunity, window of opportunity that he saw, and he decided to invade. And I was just there with my wife. In, in February of 2022, you know, waking up at five o'clock in the morning, hearing explosions coming and the war has started. And it was really one of those bizarre moments when you actually realize that actually wealth is here. You hear explosions. And uh, I don't know if one of you would ever see and hear those explosions. But now, seven some months later, we kind of got used to that. But on that first day when it happened, it was really big chaos. Key was a big city of 4 million people. We were trying to get in a, we got in, in a car, packed uh, whatever we could, trying to escape the city. You know, we got stuck in a traffic jam because everybody was trying to escape the city. Spent two nights on the outskirts of Kiev. Had some major battlefields were taking place just 10 kilometers from us in the Hostomel at the middle of the airport. So we could hear that battlefield, we could hear air defense systems working, and we could hear explosions. And like sitting there in the basement of that private house of our friends on the outskirts of Kiev, like thinking, oh my God, what are we going to do? What's, what's, up, what's up tomorrow? We couldn't find fuel because all the 
uh, gas stations were out of fuel. Then we were, you know, luckily I found a place we could fill up the tank and just left. I left Kiev, went to my hometown in, uh, in, in Bolochisk, which is the southwestern part of Ukraine, about 350 kilometers away from Kiev. Uh, it, was, it was a difficult trip. There were many, already many checkpoints everywhere. Uh, they were checking documents. Many Russians had come into Kiev prior to the war and they were just waiting for that to start. And they just got out and they were undermining you know, Ukraine from within. Very scary times. I remember about my thinking, and I, it was all blurred. I really, couldn't really think straight. I didn't know what to do. So we came to, to the hometown, to my hometown, stayed there another several days. And my wife said, you know, take us out. We want to go abroad because, you know, because bomb alerts come all the time. And you, you're like, you know, we, and we're jumping there in the basement of the, my parents' house. And it's still cold, it's still winter. And, and, it's, uh, and it's very difficult. So we, many of my friends in Europe sent me a note that Vassal, come over, you know, send your family, we'll take care. But the border with Poland was, was, was overcrowded. It was just impossible to get through. As you know, there are 5 million Ukrainians who are now outside of Ukraine. We picked Romania because we figured Romania was easier to get to. It was only a four-hour drive from the place where we stayed. The border was not as crowded as the border with Poland. So I, I, I drove a car to the border. There was a huge line of cars out there. And I remember we just parked in that line. And I decided to walk to the checkpoint to see how long is a, is a line. So I, it took me an hour, about four kilometers to get to the checkpoint. And it's snowing, it's in the middle of nowhere and all these cars out there. And on the way back, when I walk, I run into my friend, Natalia, and I say, hey, Natalia, good to see you. And I just saw her two weeks before that in the office of the Minister of Economy in Ukraine. And we were kind of chit-chatting and, and talking. And two weeks later, I see her with two little kids in a car with her parents there and standing and I'm like, hey, Natalia, what's up? How long have you been in this queue? And she goes, I've been here 28 hours. And there were still three kilometers to go. I'm like, okay, this is another 24 hours out there. So the only solution, the best solution was like, you know, to get my wife and two kids just to walk uh, to cross the border on foot because I couldn't take a car anyways, I was driving it. So it was the easiest way to do it. So they just, you know, we, we got actually a Red Cross car, which delivered them to the, to the checkpoint and the cross border on foot. And my, my friend's family met them on the other side. And uh, they went and stayed for a week. Um, there's my friends from Moldova who now live in Romania. And they stayed in the Carpathians for a week in, in the mountains. And then I found a flat in Romania, in Bucharest, where they stayed for another three weeks. And I got appointed as an ambassador. Um, I got nominated and, and in mid-March. And then I picked up my credentials and I traveled and I made it here last week of, of, of March. So as, as it's interesting because I'm political appointee, so I'm not a career diplomat. So I came here without a diplomatic passport and I came here even without a suit. So, because you don't really pack a suit when you when the war starts, right? And I got many suits in my house, right? Because I was in public affairs. So I had to wear many suits, but I couldn't take, you know, you don't think about it, right? And when the war started, I had no clue if I would get appointed eventually, though my appointment started back in December. So anyways, I bought a suit here at Canberra Center and, uh, and then went and met the Minister of Foreign Affairs, met the Minister of Defense. Then President Zelensky spoke here in the parliament on the 31st of March and next day presented my credentials here uh, to the Governor General on the 1st of April. And, and then it's been, it's been a whirlwind. Uh, I was very, I'm very blessed to be in Australia, to be frank. I mean, uh, this is such a beautiful country and um, I've, I've traveled a lot here. I think for the past seven months, I've been in Canberra maybe four or five weeks, weeks. So I traveled all over. I've been to Ukraine twice already since I arrived here. I'm going again next week. And um, I was there once with Prime Minister Albanese. That was a very historic trip out there. The first time in, in our bilateral relations that we got a Prime Minister of Australia who came and visited Ukraine. And uh, I could spend 12 hours with Prime Minister there. And you know, this is, um, so he arrived in the morning by train and I was out there uh, waiting at the train station. I came two days sooner before that. 
um, working on the visit. And it was so hot that day. It was like plus 35, early July. Kiev in July is unbearable, to be frank. Everybody who lives in Kiev tries to escape Kiev in July and August. Because actually, Kiev is a very hot place. It's, it's not cold there, by the way. I mean, this is stereotype. So Kiev can be really unbearable in August and July. And I'm there meeting Prime Minister and said, welcome, Prime Minister. This is special Sydney summer for you, so that you feel like home. And, and the trip has started. Uh, it was, of course, a brief 12 hours, but in those 12 hours that I spent uh, with the Australian Prime Minister, it was very special. So we initially went to Irpin, went to Bucha, went to Hostomel. These are all the suburbs of Kyiv where the battlefields have taken place, where we, the first war crimes were reported, crimes against humanity were reported. And, you know, though I've been out, I was here when it all went green of Durant, when the Russians have withdrawn from 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 northern part of Kiev, we learned about what has happened there under occupation, and I was there telling Australian media what was happening there, conveying the story. But one thing is actually to convey the story, but it was a totally different thing to be there actually and hear the witness accounts, and this is what gives you a totally different perspective. So we were there in Bucha at that church. And you know we have a guide there, and we have a priest, and they tell us a story. This is a church, and that's the ch church is still under construction, so it's kind of a still a construction site in a way. And they show us a land there, which is you know next to the church. They said, "Oh, this is a place of a mass grave where two hundred people were buried, buried, all civilians. They all were executed because they're Ukrainians." In that little village or town, small town, Russians killed 461 people, just randomly. Men, women, kids, because they just could kill them. And the way they killed them, it just, it just obscene. A lot of people were executed with their hands tied. Men were, and women were raped. Kids were raped and killed. This is just, and we are still discovering graves of those civilians who were killed. And this is where this Holocaust story has come back to me. And I've spoken here at two synagogues and I tell them this story. And I'm like, it happened 80 years ago and we are in 2022, it's happening again. Russians were actually walking from door to door and asking people, what do you do for a living? What's your occupation? If you were a teacher in school, you were executed immediately. Because for them, it was actually a mark that if you're a teacher, it doesn't matter what you teach, but you teach at the Ukrainian school, you get killed. It's happened in Izum, in Kharkiv region. Once we liberated Izum, we found mass graves of people in the forest, and we're still counting how many got killed. Pretty much the same tactic. And you will say, why are they doing it? Actually, there is a military reasoning for that. The reason to kill civilians, torture them, and actually terrorize people is to actually subdue and, and terrorize the whole nation. Because once you learn about what Russians do, you like, you actually stop fighting because it's so petrifying. And there, and there is a military logic to that because it's part of the big psyop against the whole nation. I think Putin did not expect us to mount such a major um, defense of Ukraine. I think he really underestimated our willingness to fight and actually our willingness to defend our country. All the Western analysts were given three days that Ukraine will fall. And everybody would have to deal with a new public government, whatever Russians would, would, would install. And that was kind of the prevalent uh, position out there. But we were now there, surprised ourselves, surprised the world by mounting not only a major defense, but now actually seeing how we've been able to do a counter offense and being able to liberate large swathes of land in the East and the South. So we now have a lot to share. Thank you.
Australia is a very popular country in Ukraine now. Uh, the Bushmasters are out there helping Ukrainians. And Bushmaster has become a symbol of Australian support for Ukraine. Not only they're good armored uh, mobility vehicles, because they're really protecting personnel from landmines, so they are saving lives, but they're also helping us defend democracy, defend human rights, defend all those fundamental values which you Australians value so much. And I think it's a vital investment for Australia, which is true to, to its tradition of a fair go. Everybody in Ukraine was extremely delighted to see this first batches of military assistance coming. So every time there was a new announcement, it was all over Ukrainian news. Like Australia sent this and that, here are the boost monsters, here is more artillery, here, here are you know, anti-tank missiles. Now it's 400 million Australian dollars. Australia is top 10 countries, it's the top 10 of military suppliers to Ukraine. It's huge. President Zelensky spoke in the parliament here at the end of March. He then again spoke here at the ANU in early August. It was a great event and uh, I was very happy that we could do it. 20 other universities were participating. It was 88,000 people who would watch it live. Many universities have hosted watch parties. Recently, Zelensky spoke at Lowy two weeks ago, and he talked about Australian support and how much he values it, values it and how much Ukrainian people value it. And even for me, I, I've spoken to different audiences here throughout the time that I've been here, and um, especially when I go out there to, to a country. Uh, two weeks ago, we were in Albert Vodonga, and I spoke at the Rotary International event there, and about 200 people showed up from Albrecht, from Wodonga, several Rotary clubs out there. And, you know, and this kind of meetings really give me an indication why more support will be coming from Australia, because I see so much support on a grassroots level. And I think people do understand that we can't afford to let Ukraine fall. Because if Ukraine falls, we're going to see some serious negative implications throughout the world. And the implications of that war, they already felt here big time. Look at what's going on on international commodity markets. The prices are very volatile. The prices for energy, coal, your utility bills have surged. Apart from all the pressure which is out there from on inflation and everything. It's, it's really creating a lot of uncertainty and instability. The global supply chains, chains which have been affected so much by COVID, are now again disrupted. Ukraine is one of the biggest food producers in the world. Russian invasion of Ukraine have created one of the biggest food crises in, and in the world that we've ever seen. Many people in Africa are now starving because they can't get a hold of the Ukrainian food. Countries in the Middle East, Horn of Africa, they totally depend on our wheat, on our animal feed, on, on vegetable oils. Ukraine is, is the biggest producer of sunflower oil in the world. 50% of all sunflower oil is produced in Ukraine. Sunflower oil is a key ingredient in baby food. Did you see the prices for baby food here? They've all gone up for that reason. Now, you're a rich country. But imagine what's happening in Africa. The prices for baby food, they're going up as well. So guess what's happening? Kids don't get enough food and they die. This is happening in Chad. This is happening in other countries. It's just unbelievable. And now we have to see what Russia is doing. So the food crisis which Russia has created artificially by invading Ukraine, by blocking the export of grain and, and food from Ukraine, now they go out there to Africa and Asia and say, oh, this is Americans who want to starve you. Americans and the West, even West, they want to starve you and to get you killed so you don't get food. And many people in those sad part of the world kind of bind to that. And this is, this is a very negative trend that we are seeing. It's important to step up communications by Australia, but also other governments of actually countering that narrative. 
because the colonial past out there, which you know is felt differently in different countries, that once you get this message out there, that actually it is West to blame for this food crisis, <coughs> could be quite quite compelling to, to many audiences actually, especially in Asia and, and, and in Africa. So it's so important to step it up and to be making sure to explain what's going on and why Russia has invaded Ukraine and what caused the food crisis and what do we do with that. Only recently, Ukraine has been able to unblock the Black Sea ports to get some grain out since the end of July. Uh, and up to now, we've been able to export over 6 million tons of grain. Usually, we export 5 million tons of grain per, year, per, per month. But this is still a trickle. We have a hard time, and this is only for wheat and grain, but it's not for, for other products, right? So a lot of other products like iron ore, and we are big uh, producers of iron ore, just like you are, we can't export it. So we've stopped quarries. We are not extracting iron ore because we can't get it to the Black Sea ports to export it to the global markets. So our economy is now suffocating. 70% of Ukraine's export goes from Black Sea ports. And it's only some grain that we can get out to the market. Russians have deliberately hit and continue destroying our civilian infrastructure. The massive strikes, missile strikes of last week, broad country, 30% of the country was in blackout. There was no electricity. So this, this deliberately target power generation facilities. They're targeting heating stations. They're targeting water supplies. They're hitting dams to create floods in the country. They're, and these are real crimes. That Russians are perpetrating in Ukraine. We need air defense systems. We need artillery. We need these weapons to defend ourselves. But we are out there not only defending ourselves, we are there defending democracy. We are out there at the front lines. Because you see, it's not about the sum of the territory that Russia wants. Russia wants to destroy Ukraine as a state. Um, a prime minister of, of, of Israel, Golda Meir, by the way, she was born in Kiev and she, she grew up in Kiev, and then she moved to Israel and became a prime minister. She once said that we want to leave and that they want us to get killed. There is no room for negotiation out here. We can't negotiate that. We have to fight and we have to defend ourselves. But you see, the Russians, and you were surprised, 81% of people in Russia support this war. Russians have started losing on the ground starting from early September. We've been able to liberate large swathes of land. So guess what's happening? There's so much pressure in Russia on Putin that he's not cracking down enough on Ukraine. They're encouraging him to use the nukes to crack down on our civilian infrastructure and just win the war because there's an expectation that Russia must win. Russia always wins. Russia won the Second World War. So we out there, it's our holy war. Now, you have to look what soldiers Russia has sent to Ukraine. And this is very interesting because historically Russia has been practicing its ethnic policy. And this ethnic policy, you know, started by Stalin, but it was even before that. Russia was just moving people around, killing certain ethnic groups, deporting others. And they've been doing it, you know, for a long time. In 1944, Russians have deported indigenous people of Ukraine, Crimean Tatars who live in Crimea, all to Central Asia. They just put them on trains in the middle of winter and send them to Central Asia. Most of them died before they even arrived there. 300,000 people were moved forcefully. They could only come back when Ukraine became independent. 350,000 people, Crimean Tatars, indigenous people of Ukraine, are now again under Russian occupation. Again, they're being persecuted. Many activists get abducted and killed. Many are as political prisoners in jails in Russia. And they're relieving the memories of their ancestors back from 1944 were deported to Central Asia. The leadership of, of the Crimean Tatars are all in Kyiv. They can't go to Crimea. And they're suffering and they're going through that again. Russians have dropped it, all the indigenous people of Russia, for the first wave of war. If you look at those who got killed, and we killed over 60,000 Russians, 
another 120,000 were wounded. But if you look at their origin, these are primarily ethnic minorities, people from Buryatia, Dagestan, um, and other places of smaller nations, or many of those in Russia, primarily Muslim, who were sent out to Ukraine, and now they got all killed. They continue to draft people in among those minority groups. And it's done on purpose. They don't drop people in Moscow and St. Petersburg. They go there to these rural areas of ethnic minorities. And now there are villages out there where the entire male population was decimated. They're gone. They all came back in coffins if they ever came, if they ever came back. And that's done on purpose. And that's part of this racist Russian policy, which is out there, which is really embraced by the political leadership of Russia, and which has been practiced throughout Putin's rule for the past 20 years. They never talked about it, right? We're all Russians. Let me tell you a story of what just happened earlier this week, which is kind of a very interesting story. So there are some Tajiks um, from Tajikistan, but they you know, moved to Russia, became Russian citizens. And there are some Tajiks which were drafted in their last mobilization in Russia. They are, they are Muslim. So uh, the story I reported from, from the news, which I've just read, but you can Google the story. So these two Tajiks end up in Belgrade, which is a city closest to Ukraine at the military training ground. So they have a lineup in the morning and, uh, and the Russian commander, whoever is in charge of that, goes out and gives them kind of an inspirational morning talk, right? This is our holy war. And this two Tajik men say, well, for us, holy war is only against the infidels. The war in Ukraine is not a holy war and it's not our war. And that commander goes, your Allah is a coward. He must fight this war with us. So right after that lineup out there in the morning, they go out there to a shooting range. So two Tajiks get the gun. They go and kill that commander and kill another 17 people. Because calling this war a holy war in a Muslim group, and they call an Allah a coward, is a huge offense. But Russians don't get it. Russia has been chauvinistic, and this is part of their state policy. 20% of Russian population is Muslim, by the way, 20%. It's huge. But very few people actually realize it. Now, order of church, which is really bizarre. In the Soviet Union, all churches were banned. Protestants could not practice. Greek Catholics were underground, banned, killed, sent to Siberia. The only legal church in the Soviet Union was Orthodox, but you could never really practice. All Orthodox priests were KGB agents, and they just watched who shows up in, in the church, and they're immediately reported to the KGB, right? And it's interesting when Soviet Union collapsed, those KGB people still stayed in the church, right? And it's interesting how Russia has been using church to drive hatred against Ukrainians, using religion as a way to mobilize people. And this is phenomenal from the standpoint of state government communications, how government has used a church to create a whole big campaign of hatred against Ukrainians by using religion, using God. All these Russian priests have been blessing Ukraine, the Russian weapons, all these, you know, ballistic missiles used against Ukraine, as if they are doing a God's work, killing fascist Nazi in Ukraine. And they've been able to mobilize church at a huge and a very, like, very strong level from the standpoint of manipulating big, uh, you know, large uh, groups of people. It's an interesting story. And um, of how you can do it from a state level. And let me tell you one another story here. So Shoigu is a, a minister of defense in Russia. And he comes from Buryatia, right? If I'm correct, I'm not sure where Shoigu is from. He's one of the smaller nations, probably most likely Muslim. So he's a minister of defense in Russia. And every year there's a big parade on the 9th of May. And this parade is a big thing for Ukraine as well, because it's a parade uh, you know, about victory in the Second World War. And it's kind of, you know, we have many people, you know, by the way, in the Second World War, 
Uh, there were 12 million Ukrainians which got killed by the Nazi, followed by Belarus, and only then followed by Russia. So most, mostly Ukrainians who got killed in the Second World War. That's an interesting fact to remember. But anyways, all these parades are big things. And Russian state media has been using those parades as a way to mobilize a nation because it's such an emotional event and for everybody and everybody still remembers Second World War, you know, from generation to generation, it passed away. But parades are kind of an interesting thing, right, in authoritarian countries. So pretty much as of, you know, the last 12, 15 years, Putin has actually whitewashed the reputation of Stalin. You know, Stalin was denounced in the Soviet Union. What was it, the 20th uh, meeting of the, of the Communist Party in 1961 or 62 when, when, when Stalin was denounced. So kind of Stalin kind of disappeared from the Soviet literature for 30 years. And then Vladimir Putin kind of revived the image of Stalin, justifying whatever he did for the sake of building a strong country. And this parade is really so well because now all of a sudden during a parade, you see all these people carrying Stalin portraits out there, right? And it's not only the portraits, there are also portraits of those people who were killed in the Second World War. But then all of a sudden, you see religious groups carrying icons during parade, military parade. And this, that, this is my favorite part. So uh, the Minister of Defense Shoigu is in a car, right? So there are different kind of branches of, 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 of the armed forces out there. And he's in that car, like doing this, doing that, you know, kind of like, and it's a close up and it's all about television, right? So everybody's watching that on television. So there is a whole close up on him. And all of a sudden his car, it was 2015 when I, when I saw it, he, it just comes to a place where all these other people are with icons. And he's wearing a military uniform. He's got a, ca a, a cap and he goes like this. And it's, there is a big close up on him. Right, and I'm like thinking, why would he do that? Most likely, he's not even Christian. Secondly, he is wearing a military uniform, and it's a parade. It's not actually appropriate to do that when you're wearing a military uniform, and you don't just don't do it. But it was done on purpose. It was actually planned. That's one of the ways how you actually communicate that our army is holy, blessed by God. Whatever we do is justified. And everybody who gets killed will go to heaven right away, right? Sounds familiar, right? And we Russians have won the war and we never lose, we always win. That's kind of a prevailing narrative which is out there, right? That nobody ever kind of talks in Russia about that it was Soviet Union who started the Second World War in 1939, dividing Poland, invading Baltic states. They never talk about that in Russia. So for Russia, the war started in 1941 when Nazi came, right? So nobody talks about what happened two years before that. And the way history is used for, for, for driving propaganda is huge. And all the hatred towards Ukrainians which has been created out there in the domain of Russian media has been phenomenal. This is something we have to deal with on the daily basis. 